Uh, welcome to my usual ramblings, this time prior to the game against Millwall. Um, and so they're looking at different lead-ins to connections between the Blades and Millwalls. We're going to go down a different path today and hopefully end up at the right place. Uh, but we were talking in the tea room the other day about the uh, sort of changing players' lives before, during and after football. And one of the most popular destinations other than pubs uh, for players as a business, as a source of income, used to tend to be shops. And speaking as the son, in fact, to my birth certificate, it says my dad's occupation was a master news agent and tobacconist. Whatever one of those is, he had a sweet shop <laughs> on Burley Moor Road. And the sweet shop, when we had uh, we had it for years, uh, Topper Occupation Lane uh, belongs these days to another big blade who's well known, Kaz Ahmed. And Aya Kaz, if you're watching this. Uh, that's where I grew up. And on a Saturday night, particularly after a game, of course, the whole ritual of the green and being delivered used to be incredible. It's hard to think that these days the green and only exists online. Uh, but certainly when I was a kid, it used to be a big part of the day on a Saturday. We'd get back from the lane. I always remember at night when it was raining, cold winter nights, and the shop was always full of smell of fags, people congregating inside, having a fag, buying the spice for the evening taking the missus home some chocolates to make up for the fact they'd been in the ale all day before the game. Uh, and I could still see the star vans now, I used to hurtle up the drive, the old uh, purple and sort of pearl maroon and red uh, Austin vans that they used to have with the gold star livery on the side. And they'd literally just lob uh, a bale of greenings in and disappear off into the night. And I could see him now cutting open the, uh, the binding on and my dad ready to dish him out. Uh, my dad always used to wear a shop coat, a bit like Arkwright in uh, Open All Hours. And he was famed for wearing a bow tie. Simply because my dad was that dope, he used to, with a Stanley blade, uh, used to slit the bailing on the uh, on the newspapers. We always chop the end off his tie. And he used to get through a, so many ties he took to wearing a bow tie. Uh, but I can still remember that as a kid, the whole sort of uh, ritual of the arriving of the green. And, Shops in Sheffield United, we look back down the years and the one which always used to get linked to the Blades and be a big part of the culture of the club for many years was the one that everybody remembers as Jack Archer's on Bramall Lane. Little sports shop. In fact, when I was a kid, I remember going in with my dad. I remember the smell of the different things in there as well. Um, and I think it was Jack Archer's daughter back in those days that used to run it. And it was all these wonderful wooden boxes of stuff. I'm sure people my age and above remember going in there in the days before a sports superstore was a really big thing. Uh, but it started out life originally as uh, George Waller's shop. And George Waller was a bit of a Sheffield football legend. Uh, Waller played for the other side of the city in the 1890 FA Cup final, which they lost quite conclusively. Uh, also played for Yorkshire at cricket, played up for Middlesbrough. We mentioned George before. Uh, and we moved heaven and earth to sign him. Uh, came to Sheffield United at a later age, played mostly reserve team football for us, uh, played a few first team appearances in goal as well, funnily enough, uh, when he was an outfield player. But George, of course, became the, uh, you'd say the coach of the team, uh, the man with the brown bag, with 10 woodbines in it and a wet sponge. Uh, but George was a huge figure, and I think the club contributed in some way to uh, putting him on the road to business with George Waller's Gent Sports Outfitters, I think it was called then. Interestingly, the next member of the United family it belonged to, uh, it seems it was given as something as an inducement to sign for us. Uh, the team was looking for the missing piece about 1913-14. We got a good side, always in the top flight and always done quite well, but just sort of missing that, lacking that edge, shall we say. And I think we've all been there when you know you need a certain sort of player. And the player they went out and bought was a player from Barnsley. Uh, an Elsica lad called George Utley and Utley was really the missing piece of that jigsaw they signed him as a captain and what a captain he was led the Blades to the 1915 FA Cup victory over Chelsea gone to the semi the year before and then of course the First World War interrupted also the player I've got a fantastic letter in my files and the letter was written by his colleagues in the team some very very famous players it used to be customary in those days for a player to be awarded what was known as a benefit game. And a benefit game meant that they could take the gate receipts, unbelievably, of a top flight game or a game of that season uh, for their benefit season, so their payment tax-free, 
uh, but not the Wednesday or the Sunderland games, bizarrely. I think, obviously, the Sunderland game at that time was a huge match. Uh, and for some reason, even though this was forbidden, it was quite common practice for a player to take a benefit match. Um, Utley was allowed to take Sunderland, I think. And other key players, like Billy Gillespie, thought this was wrong. And it was a letter written by Gillespie, uh, featuring some of the key players at that time, to the board of directors saying that they thought as much, you know, this is out of order. You know, he's only been here two minutes, he's got the Sunderland game as his benefit, he's got a business. Uh, this is wrong, it's morally wrong, it's financially wrong. And in actual fact, that was the key letter that got the old system of the benefit games dropped. Not the testimonials as we probably remember them. Um, but the old benefit idea was changed as a result of uh, Sheffield United's team's exception to utterly getting arguably the biggest home game of the season for his benefit match. Uh, but Utley also had the shop, he took it off of, uh, off of George Wallace, so for a time it was Utley's uh, before he moved on. Uh, the First World War obviously intervened, he went to Man City from us, uh, spent a spell at Fulham, uh, also coaching at Wednesday. Finished up at Russell College uh, on the file coast near Blackpool, where he lived, um, lived out his life, beautiful house, big house there, and two housekeepers, never had any kids. Uh, with his wife. He and his wife got married at Baton. I've got photographs of the wedding. Brilliant. Big old Wesleyan church on the main road. Uh, but when he died, he left his entire estate to nephews and his housekeeper. And I believe the housekeeper sold the house and the land, or the family sold the house and land, but she lived on what would have been Utley's estate, if you like, till the day she died. Such was the way she was held in esteem by George Utley. His medals went down Nephews. I just remember one nev uh, nephew in Sheffield uh, having his 1912 FA Cup winners medal with Barnsley, because he played as part of that team. That's why the runners up medal with Barnsley. And another nephew in Denby Dale had his Cup winners medal, which we've now got. Um, but another sort of link people who had chops. And the one I want to touch on today is the one who had a link with Sheffield United and with Millwall, a guy called Bert Lipson. Now, United signed Bert Lipson from Crew, and that's the area he came from. And I think quite famously signed him on Crew Railway Station. We were trying to escape from us or whatever. Uh, but Lipsom came to Sheffield United and played a key part. Not in the earliest of teams. He came about 1900, 1899, 1900. Uh, but got an FA Cup runners-up medal against Spurs in 1901. Was a cup winner with the Blades in 1902. Played for England, played for the Football League. Was some player now. I was like this. At the time he was playing for Sheffield United... Bert Lipsom had a tobacconist shop uh, on Bramall Lane next to the ground. Now imagine this. This is a top flight England international football player. And uh, his day-to-day -day business, while he's also playing for the Blades, is selling fags uh, and <laughs> spice and all the wonderfully unhealthy stuff that we all know is bad for us today. Uh, but he made a living out of that for a number of years while he was a Blades player. Now eventually, Bert went to Millwall where he's regarded as the first proper player manager or first proper manager of Millwall uh, when they were still a fledgling football club coming from the Isle of Dogs and um, formed from the employees of the local jam factory quite famously. Uh, but Bert Lipson was some player um, at that time, one of the real stars of Sheffield United. Interestingly, <clears throat> when he went over and finished at Millwall, he ended up in Canada and Lipson played a huge part in the formation of what we would now know as the Canadian Football Association. And it was fascinating to me, in the early 1960s, Sheffield United under John Harris went out on one of the fabled pre-season or post-season tours where they'd be gone for six or seven weeks and they went out to America and Canada. Uh, Len Badger made his first team debut at Soldier Field on that tour. And the Canadian leg of the tour was arranged by Bert Lipsom's son. So there's a connection with Sheffield United 50 or 60 years after he last played for the club, uh, going out to Canada and playing a series of games over there as exhibition matches, which Lipsom's son had uh, arranged on behalf of the two parties. And we came back with this totem pole, which I have on display in the museum. I rescued it from a dark cupboard under the stand at Bramall Lane 15, 20 years ago. Uh, and it's a bizarre thing to say the least, but we brought back a totem pole, so I bet there's not many clubs do that. But Lipson, when he was out there uh, and playing his part in the formation of 
organised football in Canada. Um, lost his arm in a sawmill accident. Don't know quite how that happens when he's working for the Canadian uh, Football Association, but lose an arm he did. And then a little bit later, he came to his end and met his maker uh, in a train crash. So I don't know why they called him Lucky Lips, and I've got no idea, but uh, he uh, certainly did both and played a big part in the formation of the game across here. Also, of course, in terms of retail, Jimmy Hagen and Harold Brook had their own sports shop on Bramall Lane, Brook and Hagen. And when both the girls were alive, when Irene and Iris, the wives, were alive, they used to tell me that they used to open the shop on a Saturday afternoon while the lads were playing. And then they'd shut up sort of four o'clock, quarter past four, lock up and rush down to get in through the red gate. In those days, of course, they used to open the exit gates at half times, so people wandering and do what they wanted. But the wife of the captain and the star player used to shut the shop early to rush down and try and catch the last 15 minutes of the game with the husbands playing uh, again in top flight football. Unbelievable. I think Doc Pace had one as well, uh, a sports shop on Abbeydale Road. And of course, the first Sheffield United venture uh, was the little shop on the corner of Countess Road, John Street side of the ground, which was our first proper souvenir shop, opened by the lead singer of Pickety Witch. Look that up as a band. Even my pop knowledge didn't extend to the, uh, the membership of that one. Um, but that was our first try. And it doesn't seem that long ago to me since we had a little shop down in the corner of this stand where Mrs. Sprintall, bless her, Bertha Sprintall used to keep the money for things in a biscuit tin. Uh, you'd do a shirt launch in something about the size of a, a porter cabin, and all the money used to go in a, a biscuit tin behind the counter. Unbelievable, that ain't that long ago. Uh, so that's a little bit of a Sheffield United connection with retail. Uh, a little bit about Bert Lipsom and Sheffield United and Millwall, um, and his tobacconist shop, top flight player selling fags, uh, as a welcome and a lead into what should be a fantastic game a beautiful downtown Bramall Lane tomorrow against our colleagues from Millwall and we hope you enjoy the game.